So uh, let's welcome Professor Martin Dunn. So Martin is a professor and dean of the College of Engineering, Design and Computing at the University of Colorado Boulder. He joined uh, Colorado uh, Denver in, uh, in 2018 after serving as professor and founding associate provost for research at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, where he was in charge of the design. He, he was overseeing the design and operation of the research and innovation enterprise. Prior to that, he was serving as a program director at the US National Science Foundation. So Marty's research focuses on understanding the mechanics and physics of complex heterogeneous materials through a combination of theory and experiment, and using this understanding to create methods and tools to design and manufacture new materials and components. He has received international recognition and award for his research accomplishment, as well as an, as an award for product de design with the methods and tools developed from his research. So Martin, I will give you the, the floor now for your, for your presentations, and we are going to play your recording uh, that you sent us. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be with you and have the opportunity to share a little bit on our recent work on the design and additive manufacture of composites. I am really grateful to Professor Lubinu and his team from the Center for the Mechanics of Composites for Energy and Mobility. I was really grateful to receive the invitation to participate in the conference, and I really appreciate all the work you've done in these trying times to transition the conference from uh, an in-person to a remote offering. While I was very, very much looking forward to visiting KAUST and participating in person. I am thrilled to be able to be with you this afternoon and talk about our work. As I get started, I want to acknowledge a handful of folks whose collaboration has been central to the work that I'm talking about today. First and foremost, my colleagues, Jerry Chi at Georgia Tech and Kurt Mounte at the University of Colorado, my long-term collaborators, and Jerry's with us today and giving a talk a little bit later. A lot of the work that's been done has been done by in, a, in this presentation by Oliver Wieger, who's now at, at TU Darmstadt in Germany, and Narasima Bodetti, who's now at Washington State University in the US. Uh, I wanna acknowledge my, my colleagues, Pablo Valdiva in, at Singapore University of Technology and Design, SUTD, and my colleague Kai Yu at the University of Colorado at Denver for their collaboration and their great work. I'm grateful for the support of Dr. Les Lee and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, as well as support from the Singapore University of Technology and Design, Digital Manufacturing and Design Center, and a collaboration with Stratasys that has led to some of the voxel printing work that I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, before jumping into the technical talk, I just wanted to share a little bit uh, of, about where I am from and where I am now. It's currently about 5 a.m. in Colorado, the state of Colorado in the United States. And if I live in Denver, which on the screen is shown here, kind of right at the intersection, what we call the front range of the Rocky Mountains, about a thousand miles to the west, and the Great Plains, another 1,000 to 2,000 miles to, to the east. So Denver is a fantastic city. It's growing, it's booming, it's dynamic, it's filled with energy. This is a picture of our campus right on the edge of the downtown Denver looking east at a gorgeous sunrise. Uh, looking the opposite direction, you see the city and the fantastic Rocky Mountains that I alluded to kind of earlier. So I'm grateful to have the opportunity to live and work in Denver. And I encourage each of you to, when you get the chance, if you get the chance to visit Denver, and I'd be happy to host you, you know, when you do. To get started, I want to motivate some of our work, which is really, as I mentioned, a design and additive manufacturing, kind of by mentioning some exciting emerging applications, kind of with uh, soft active composite materials. And these show a, a snapshot of ideas and applications that I pulled just recently off of the web, ranging from soft robotics and gripping uh, delicate objects to healthcare to sensing in challenging environments such as underwater, 
to performance, high performance kind of clothing, shoes. This is the Adidas, uh, recent Adidas shoe with 3D printed lattice structures that are carefully designed kind of in the, in the sole of the shoe to work that my colleague, Chris Yukaki at the University of Colorado Denver and his company Impressio Tech is working to integrate 3D printing kind of with a novel liquid crystal elastomer materials technology to create kind of next generation protective gear and specifically helmets for American football, bicycling and, and the military. So all of these exciting applications that are rapidly emerging and having a lot of attention have a lot of characteristics in common. The materials are soft, they're flexible, they're stretchy. They're often used to create structures at multiple scales that are heterogeneous, take advantage of anisotropy and are complex, have complex microstructures. They also have application application specific characteristics such as some of them need to be tough, they need to be corrosion resistant, they need to be energy absorbing. I'm going to kind of motivate the work just further a little bit further more by showing a video of recent kind of work of a uh, that we've just published that shows in the the video shows a, a soft batoid swimming robot designed by Pablo Valdiva at SUTD that kind of really sets the stage for a lot of our work and its motivation by the intersection, things at the intersection of advanced additive manufacturing technologies, new materials, kind of soft and composites. The, the fins here are complex heterogeneous composite structures designed to meet specific hydrodynamic uh, constraints and, and objectives. And then finally, the dovetailing of this with new technologies with regard to uh, uh, modeling, simulation, and design of sub such structures and, and materials. Our work kind of really takes a, a perspective at this intersection of manufacturing materials and design of developing tip to tail digital workflows to design and additively manufacture these kind of materials. And our work largely is addressed at answering a lot of interesting research questions that arise kind of when you try to pull all of these technologies together. And I'll talk about those kind of as we kind of move through the talk kind of here. Um, I mentioned drawing on emerging and rapidly evolving new manufacturing technologies based on additive or 3D printing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about voxel-based material jetting. Not that it's more important than anything else, but that it sets the stage about a perspective of where the future uh, I think lies. And that's the ability to place multiple materials anywhere you want in a three-dimensional space at high resolution voxel by voxel. I'll talk a little bit and show examples of, of uh, projection micro stereo lithography that more recently can create similar types of materials and structures. Uh, the, the robotics work that I showed you was enabled by a hybrid material extrusion embedded direct right 3D printing technology. And I'll share a couple of recent accomplishments that we've done on, on continuous fiber continuous carbon fiber printing in a three-dimensional uh, uh, printing technology. I mentioned I want to say a few things about voxel-based material jetting. Uh, specifically, kind of what I'm showing here is a technology that's commercially available by strategists called their polyjet technology. And in essence, what it does is it prints in an inkjet kind of format uh, multiple photopolymer droplets at a resolution of about 600 by 300 by 845 dots per inch. This results in the ability to control the placement of either a stiff or a soft polymer, the former having a modulus of about two gigapascals, the latter of about one megapascal, uh, at re a resolution of voxel size of somewhere between 30 and 70, 80 
uh, kind of microns on a side. Just to put this in perspective, then, if you can place material at this precision in space, a cubic millimeter of material would contain about 20,000 voxels of this precisely de de deposited material. And this can be used to make, you know, to make structures on the order of, you know, half to a, a meter. Um, we can then use this layout of these digital uh, voxelated materials to create so-called digital composite materials. And I'll talk about this here kind of going forward. So that concept kind of requires thinking about manufacturing and design and modeling simulation of multiple length scales. Three that are important here, kind of working backward, kind of are, if I think about a structure, kind of there's a certain length scale associated with that structure. Kind of here I mentioned we can make kind of artifacts on the order of meters with resolution or features on the order of millimeters. I introduced the idea of a material point in any continuum solid. And there I have a represented volume element that kind of demonstrates uh, that, that's shown kind of here in the middle that is of a composite architecture, in this case of red and blue materials. And red is that stiff material I alluded to, and blue is that soft material. And those are created kind of by having, you know, multiple repeats of a voxel scale uh, kind of print that I can control that I alluded to. And that's shown here. So again, by printing at this voxel scale, I can abstract that up to a material scale where I can just introduce the idea of an effective material property and then create artifacts, structures, where the material property, say the effective stiffness, varies spatially across them. At the voxel scale, I can control how I lay out and then ultimately print materials and create different uh, volume fractions of red and blue, different architectures of red and blue, and ultimately different material behavior. We've kind of done a lot of work with this concept and kind of what's shown here are a set of so-called digital composites that we've created that are uh, used to characterize the material and create measure the effective behavior of this composite that ranges from say 0% to 100% uh, soft elastomer to stiff glassy polymer. And you can see the wide variety of stress strain behavior. And I should also mention other thermomechanical behavior exists as well that we can create by creating these patterns of materials. We can create graded structures, and I show some examples here of kind of grading from soft to stiff and stronger and less strong gradients of soft to stiff and from left to right and from up to down and across, you know, uh, at a diagonal in two and three dimensions. Kind of these show underneath the designed gradients, actual bit maps of printed solids that we've created and then results that we've done from experiments of tensile tests of experiments and simulated results to show that we can confidently distribute material throughout this volume in various kind of ways and characterize it and, and predict it. Um, just in passing, I'll mention these materials were created using the Stratasys Polyjet technology but emerging new technologies are achieving similar results. I'll show, you know, just highlight kind of a new technology from Jerry Chee's lab at Georgia Tech that uses grayscale digital light processing with a homogeneous base polymer resin to create the same kind of spatial resolution and property variation. And it's a very exciting advance that again <coughs> allows one to create highly heterogeneous and optimally designed materials and structures. I'm gonna kind of spend a few minutes talking through in the next slide, our overall approach. And it's quite 
uh, high level and I, I hope it's accessible, but I'm gonna give it a shot and then I'm gonna come through and just show a bunch of examples throughout the remainder of our talk. But basically we're concerned, I'm gonna jump to this idea in red. We're concerned with designing a component that has material properties that vary point by point in the component and take on different material properties at each point. And the way that we take on different material properties as I've described is by changing the microstructure in a continuous fashion from point to point in the, in, in the solid. So we do this kind of through a series of four steps in a digital workflow where we start with a material underlying material microstructure. I already showed you this red and blue digital material, digital composite as I called it. We've worked a lot with uh, microstructures that are various types of lattices that can then be kind of strung together as well as fibrous composites containing short and stiff fiber, short and continuous fibers. The basic idea is kind of the microstructure gives rise to properties in terms of the you know, microstructural parameters, things like volume fraction and orientation and, and geometry. And we can vary things like the modulus, the thermal expansion, et cetera, you know, by varying the microstructure. microstructure. The core of a lot of our work is a, a technique that is a, a multi-scale topology optimization approach that sort of works as follows. We set up a design problem by specifying a three-dimensional domain, say this gray red area here, subject to some loads and boundary conditions, those are constraints. And then we ask the optimizer to say, help us distribute material throughout this design domain so that I can meet some performance objective. Perhaps that performance objective is to maximize the stiffness subject to say a constraint on volume, or maybe it's to maximize the energy absorption or create uh, a dynamic uh, a dynamic kind of waveform throughout the, the material. So the kind of topology optimization approach then kind of goes through a, a series of finite element simulations where it continuously changes the material properties and then through this homogenization approach, the material microstructure to reveal a final layout of material that's generally non-intuitive, it's optimal. And in this case, you know, you chose gray where material exists, white where it doesn't exist. And what's also unique here is that it shows the orientation of a material or the orientation in this case of a fibrous composite microstructure. So we simultaneously design the macroscopic structure and the microstructure at each point of the material. From that, we need to manufacture the material using one of those four manufacturing technologies. We develop a set of computational geometry algorithms to dehomogenize this and turn this abstract mathematical representation into a realizable mis microstructure you know, say a layout of fibers or a, a lattice or this digital composite, and then drive a machine kind of through kind of code to actually manufacture the material. And this is an example of a manufactured sample that's about eight inches, uh, eight inches uh, by about six inches wide and long or long and, and high of this material and you can't tell it, but when you zoom in and you look closely, you can see the layout of the microstructure here. So this is the basic idea of all of our work is some form of a design problem that we computationally kind of solve using either a shape or, or topology optimization. And then we translate that kind of into a physical artifact through one of a variety of 3D printing methods. We've kind of specialized this approach for other types of, of architectures and in particular, uh, a version that's more focused on shape and composition optimization. So we start with a step of designing geometry and then 
optimizing the shape, the, the say the size of, of rods in that structure or the, the composition, the layout of material uh, composite throughout that rod microstructure and work through the same kind of, uh, of elements. And we've done that for various types of lattices and other kind of complex, complex structures. So with that kind of as the basic kind of background of our work, I wanna step through some examples now, and I hope that'll help make some of this a little bit more tangible than it might kind of might, might seem to be so, so far. So just let me start by kind of setting up a, a design problem that's shown in gray here. And I'm just going to talk through that architecture or that, that flow chart that I showed you early in words. I won't use any mathematical kind of symbols, but you should know all of this is underpinned and implemented kind of in a, in a computational environment. So the basic idea is I, I say I'm going to demonstrate creating functionally graded composite, digital composite structures. And I'm going to do it kind of with a problem. I'm going to say I have a design domain, a rectangular domain that I'm going to clamp at one side and I'm going to displace on the other end. And so I know if I have a homogeneous material and do this, what I'm going to do is stretch the material and I'm going to uniformly strain it. And I'm going to it's going to result in a linear distribution of displacement throughout the material. But I'm going to say, I'm going to apply these loads, but instead I want to lay out and optimize the composite material so that instead of having this linear distribution of displacement, I have a quadratic distribution of displacement. And that's shown in this chart here, shown, shown here. So how do I do this? Kind of the result of our optimizer then tells us, I'll start from the top here, that I need a graded material. I need one that's stiffer on one end, more compliant on the other. And the combination of that grading, okay, kind of that, that grading and the uniform load leads to a, 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 a quadratic variation in displacement. This is the grading you can kind of see that looks like. This is the actual fabricated material. And you can see a bit of that grading here it's made with a clear matrix and then red stiff materials. This is a simulation, a finite element simulation of what this structure would look like if I applied this loading and it looks pretty close to the designed desired design. And this is an experimental result kind of obtained using a technique called digital image correlation that, that kind of maps out the displacements. And you can see we get very good agreement kind of between the simulation and the, the experiment. Here's a second problem that's not so uh, easy to solve. Same setup, same desired displacement field, but instead of a uniform load on the end, I'm gonna apply a load over just a small fraction of the, the end. And so as a result, the final, you know, the resulting microstructure kind of or composite that I have to create looks very different. In this case, what I do is I, it ends up creating this stiff structure that spreads the load and then tries to make it as uniform or, or tries, tries to make it as, as uh, uh, close to fitting this quadratic distribution as I can. Again, here shown uh, 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 the actual printed version Here's a finite element simulation of this structure and of that you can see we can't, there's no way due to the localization of this load to get this perfect uniform uh, top to bottom distribution of displacement, but it does a pretty good job. And as I move away, it does better and better. And the digital image correlation results look good too, as do measurements of the stiffness of the samples and, and uh, both from measurements and experiments. Um, we've used this kind of, you know, sometimes we call it dithering or kind of voxel-based digital compos composites, you know, for more complex structures where kind of we take a, a complex shape and then what we're trying to do here is say, let me apply loads here. And if I have a uniform, homogeneous material, even in this complex rod shape, what happens is this 
loading is shown here would cause it to bend over and instead say, can I reinforce the material or design the material so it doesn't bend over, but the, the armadillo just hugs you know, uh, a one instead of, of bending and hugging. And this is the ultimate 3D printed version that we have. This shows an example of a homogeneous thing bending over the armadillo, not bending over and hugging here. So we can, we've done this and looked a lot at various lattices that we grade that have complex nonlinear behavior, including some instabilities kind of both in, in compression and tension. These are simulations in, in gray and actual uh, observed fabricated samples in black and we get pretty good results there. We create structures kind of where we've got a complex twisting that occurs when we stretch the structure. So we get, as we're familiar with in composites in general, a twist extension coupling, and we get good agreements between experiment here and, and measurements as well. Uh, we've applied this to some sort of toy problems with more complex structures, such as the Shul insole that I've described in more recently, some of these protective headgear designs. Okay, I'm going to shift gears slightly, but sticking with the same materials and talk about, you know, one example of this concept that you kind of often perhaps heard about called three called 4D printing. This idea is based kind of, uh, we, we can realize this through this printing of two materials, the, the elastomer and the glassy polymer, plus a support material that holds these two materials in place. And then we remove the support material and allow heat the resulting structure and allow it to deform. And the way it works is that we can program an intrinsic compressive stress into the elastomer. And I won't go into how we do that. Uh, I can talk about that in more detail and some of our, our paper ex explains that. But what I wanna mention is that we can do it and we can control it through the process and we can control it by the time that we uh, use to print each layer, which affects the curing of the polymer. So what I do kind of conceptually is print a bilayer of this green elastomer that has a compressive residual stress in it, a red uh, stiff material, the same one we talked about earlier, and this yellow gel support. Uh, after I print it, I remove the gel support and the material is, is flat. Whoops, I don't know where my thing went. The material kind of has this good uh, kind of high fidelity, kind of high resolution micro, you know, uh, 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 structure. Then I heat it and by heating it, what happens is the glassy polymer softens, it relaxes the, then it allows the programmed compressive stress in the elastomer to relax and causes the entire structure to bend. And then if I cool it, I can return it back, I, or I, I maintain this bent shape. So the point is I can do this in a very controllable way by creating different bilayers and I can control it by controlling the time, the thickness of each of the layers and so forth. And I can then predictably control the curvature of the, the material. Um, this shows some examples of, of experiments with different thicknesses or volume fractions of elastomer and stiff material. Uh, these are actual pictures of experimental samples and, and you can kind of see the results. I can not only print one layer on top of another layer, but this shows the ability to print a rod structure where I can not only just print a rod with say the red material on the green material, but I can twist that in space. And then as a result, kind of a print a, a straight line, heat it and create a coiled structure. And I can control that by uh, the pitch and the diameter of the material. And this shows I can kind of predict it and get good agreement between theory and prediction. I can take that concept and design more complicated structures. This shows an idea of creating a flat layered structure, two layered structure that when I heat it folds up into this soccer ball. This is the simulation. 
kind of at the top, at the bottom shows an actual experiment, kind of that that uh, kind of that that we've run and uh, over a period of about twenty seconds, and you can see the the shape folding into this final soccer ball. In fact, let me, I apologize. The bottom is the simulation and the top is the experiment. Uh, a similar complicated structure here that we printed this interesting coiling wire that could fold up into kind of this interesting shape. I mentioned our kind of approach of, of topology optimization, kind of what we call material compilation and then manufacture. Um, we, we have various forms of this topology optimization. Uh, this is a really interesting version. I won't be able to go into detail here, where instead of using a density-based method that I, that I use in the previous example, we combine a density-based and a level set-based method. Uh, let me just show you some of the kind of examples that we can do in optimizing this 4D printed kind of structure. So I basically say I want to start with a sheet. And, and this is sort of the starting point of a, a two layer structure. Uh, and I want to create out of that a material that folds up uh, one way to the top and, and one on the bottom uh, and creates a structure shown like this. So it's a very kind of difficult in some ways problem to even express mathematically how I wanna do that. It's easier for me to talk about it. And remember, I just start with a blank sheet and this is shows the optimizer kind of working through and creating this kind of final optimized structure. And you can see, I won't play it till the end, but it's starting to get more red and more blue. Remember red is elastomer, blue is the stiff material. And ultimately, you know, the final version kind of is this cross-like structure that has, you know, some red on top, some red on the bottom. And then when we heat it, this is an experimental kind of version here. Likewise, here's another desire to create a, a, a gripper like this out of the same base structure. So we formulate the design problem a little bit differently and we kind of see it again evolving. Kind of here, here's the final result that we print as a flat structure, heat it, and it kind of folds into this structure shown here. Note that all of this is another example kind of shown, shown here. It's kind of expresses bringing four fingers together. You know, one of the things I want to emphasize is the material behavior here is nonlinear. It's obviously large, geometrically nonlinear kind of deformations and so forth. Um, I, I'm going to really quickly kind of go through kind of the a section on creating fibrous composite materials and components. So far, kind of the work that I showed used these digital pixelated versions. You know, we can take the same kind of architecture and instead of using this simple microstructure, create fibrous microstructures that I can then use to create anisotropy and take advantage of that. Um, this is an example of a, 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 a structure that we've created, you know, using this 3D multi-scale topology optimization approach where it's again generating not only the macroscopic structure, but a fibrous microstructure. And in this case, they're short fibers kind of shown, shown here. Um, you know, this is uh, a set of algorithms that we then use to take that and build up and create layer by layer a printed composite. And so you're seeing essentially a simulation of the printing process layer by layer on the right. In each layer, what you're seeing is cross sections through these fibrous architecture. It's kind of as we build this structure kind of up into that final kind of three dimensional form. So when, when all is done, let's see if I can stop the darn thing. When all is done, you know, I have this three-dimensional structure that consists of a softer matrix with stiff fibers inside of it. And here are some various examples of just based on the problem formulation that we can create. We've built 2D structures out of, out of this where we vary the microstructure, say the volume fraction and the aspect ratio. 
to make the stiffest possible structure in bending kind of or in tension. Here are examples of printed structures that are on the order of about six inches kind of high, uh, kind of stiffness versus fiber aspect ratio or, or microstructure and show you know, how we get different macroscopic structures for different microstructural kind of designs. And that's in 2D, we can do similar things in 3D. The structures are more complicated and so forth though, but the technology seems to work well. Here are some just toy problems, an example of creating an, an iPhone holder, an iPad kind of holder and so forth. We've made kind of laminated plates using this, kind of where this is an eight layer laminate. I can do it kind of in a piece laminated way, curved laminates and so forth. Just more recently, we've extended this to continuous fiber, kind of which is really interesting and really challenging because it requires kind of turning this 2D uh, uh, kind of distribution into uh, a set, a realizable set of continuous fibers. Kind of we've adopted this approach from the computer graphics community, which sort of allows one to take a vector field on a surface and translate that into a pattern of stripes, kind of with discontinuities and so forth to allow us to automatically specify orientation and spacing. So it allows us to take a, a structure like this that has, again, a mathematically defined continuous fiber distribution, but turn it into a set of fibers that we can then potentially print. Uh, kind of this is an example that we've done do, using this with a, a plate with a hole in it. This shows kind of the, the, the abstract mathematical distribution of fibers, the final fibrous form, a final composite, uh, uh, displacement measurements uh, with DIC and experiments in, in, uh, in uh, the X and the, and the Y direction. I'm going to skip over this, but uh, more recently we've developed or we're in the middle of developing kind of a technology to print continuous fibers kind of as well. And let me just kind of close by spending a couple minutes going back to that kind of soft robotic bathway that I mentioned, because this is a really great example that pulls all of this together in an exciting way in my view. So the basic idea is we want to build a synthetic robotic swimming batoid. And we know, you know, from, uh, you know, we know that the kind of morphology of a batoid structure consists of a really complex skeleton and muscular structure that distributes, essentially continuously distributes actuators, you know, throughout the fins of the, of the, the batoid. Instead, kind of what we want to do is create a very simple version, a so-called under-actuated version, where we actuate it with a simple flapper actuator, and then kind of design the architecture, the a composite, soft composite um, uh, fin structure that's anisotropic and heterogeneous to mimic the kinematics of an actual batoid as best we can. So this is sort of the overall concept. We can build a lot of this with 3D printing and kind of build an autonomous micro, put a microcontroller, a, a, an inductive, rechargeable battery, a servo, and kind of a flapper inside of this shell. And then this soft shell, the idea is how do we design the distribution of, of material properties? Well, again, we, we design composite structures using the same kind of approach that I've described before, although a bit of a different fabrication approach. Uh, we set up an optimal design problem in this case, it's not something as simple as maximizing, you know, stiffness, but it's a following, you know, it's a, it's a steady state dynamic kind of uh, response uh, over a, 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 you know, over a, a period of deformation of the, of the, of the batoid fin. This is kind of an initial design that we start with of this composite, and this is an optimal design that we, that we end up with. This shows, kind of the evolution of the design 
of the composite and you can see you know showing the direction of in this case soft fibers in a in a stiffer matrix you know both actually are soft and the, the white or the blue material itself is actually an isotropic soft material so the end result ends up being and this is the the resulting behavior of the flapper but the end result ends up being a combination of isotropic and composite materials and composite materials that are oriented at different orientation. So we fabricate kind of this, kind of using kind of this embedded 3D printing multi-layer approach. I won't go kind of into this. I'll just finish by showing a couple of interesting videos. You saw one earlier of the free swimming. This is a kind of swimming and turning robot and you can see how how we can kind of turn the robot uh, all controlled autonomously kind of this shows a series of kind of at the bottom kind of maneuvers so we're able to kind of increase the maneuverability of the robot through this optimal composite uh, approach based on you know comparison to isotropic materials and so forth and what we've been able to do is increase through this, soft composite design increase the the speed of the batoid by about 50 percent the maneuverability by about 30 percent and the speed of turning by about 30 50 percent as well so in summary i know i'm running a little on time we've created new approaches and associated workflows to enable design and added manufacture of active composite materials components and components, including multi-physics, steady state dynamic behavior. And we've demonstrated this approach, the whole workflow in a variety of applications from solids, curved plates and shells to rod and lattice type structures as well. Thank you so much. ...of the different, uh, uh, when you make a specific composite and the size of the droplet or uh, size uh, will be quite a, significant effect especially i presume it will strongly depend on the on the uh, on the adhesion or the interface which is formed during this uh, composite formulation and how do you address that especially uh, the diffusion becomes a challenge uh, or uh, uh, and uh, so my first question is on that and secondly if you change the size of the droplet or change the size so you also change the surface area and uh, retrospectively, your mechanical property of the object will also change. Uh, how, how do you address that? Yeah. Um, so good. So good. Good questions. Let, let me let me try to remember the first one, but start there. Um, we, you know, the size of the droplet, sort of on the order of say 50, 60 microns, and clearly, you know, the the droplets. Uh, you know, basically you can think of them as two different kind of acrylate based materials. And certainly when two droplets kind of are put next to each other, there is diffusion there, especially as they're spread out. You know, there's sort of a roller that comes out, it spreads them out. We don't completely know what the, the we, when we haven't studied it ourselves, kind of the nature of that kind of intermixing and that diffusion across the, those two materials. Um, in terms of the scale of the materials that we make, so we make these fibrous architectures that are then perhaps on the order, you know, of closer to 800 microns or so. And we've done a lot of studies to try to understand that kind of interface effect on the mechanical kind of behavior by kind of making samples with different size fibrous architectures and looking at the mechanical behavior of that to try to determine you know, when is that, when is that size so small that those interfaces kind of uh, come into play? And we found that about 800 or so microns is, is sort of fine for a feature size of that harder material within that softer material to get kind of consistent results where apparently that, that interface isn't clear. We're working with some colleagues kind of now at the National Institute of Standards and Technology kind of in Boulder, Colorado, who have a technique, kind of a dynamic atomic force microscope technique to be able to look at, at those interfaces and sort of look at the gradation 
kind of of those. But that that's you know been our our approach has been to sort of make sure that the features that we create are big enough that that that's not an issue. Um, the the second question I think is related, and it, you know we can't with this technology change the size of the droplet, so we're limited those droplets. What we can do is change how many droplets we put next to each other, right? So if I put a whole bunch of red droplets next to, you know, and, and make a, a mega droplet, if you will, I push that interface out. And that's kind of largely kind of back to kind of the way I tried to answer the first question, how we kind of how we deal with that. But it's very clear that as you get kind of smaller and smaller, those kind of interface effects become important. The other thing that I, I didn't talk about, but what kind of what we've learned a lot about kind of is then the kind of diffusion, kind of species diffusion kind of between layer to layer, kind of as, as we hear kind of layer to layer. And, and that actually results in the, the built-in compressive strain that we can kind of build into the material for the, the so-called 4D printing. You know, that's under, un, that's ultimately the mechanism that, that results in that. So I, I hope that that helped a bit. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I will ask a last question because then we need to move to the next session. When, when you are presenting your digital workflow, you know, in which you have the optimization of the topology, yeah. I was wondering if you can say a little bit more about the way you are doing the topological optimization, because you know, in a in a classical binary material, you, you optimize the shape of the domain, right? That is more the large scale that you show in the digital workflow. But here you have a much more complex optimization problems because if you try to optimize at the voxel scales, uh, or let's say what you call the material point scales, the material properties, uh, I mean you need to do something special in your optimization to introduce some. Uh, I don't know, I would like you to say a little bit more about this because Correct. when I think about the scheme, it doesn't look so straightforward. So. Correct. I think, that, I think the simplest way to think about it is perhaps the, the following. You, you mentioned in a classical approach, what, what we would do is formulate, you know, formulate the material, that we formulate the material, the problem is a material distribution problem. Yeah. And we set up, you know, a problem where we have a continuously varying variable that's, say, the density of the material that has a connection then to, say, the Young's modulus of the material, you know, through some kind of a model. We use, you know, classically we use a, a model called SIMP or, or some other kind of model. What we do then is on top of that, kind of if you think about it, each material point, then you determine the density and we have number of kind of filters and so forth to try to drive the material, drive the solution to a zero one solution to be red or, or blue. Um, at each material point, kind of we actually don't simply have a connection between say density and a, a modulus, but density and a more sophisticated representation of the material microstructure. And that microstructure kind of in one simpler form could be an anisotropic composite, you know, that has this fibrous architecture. And so, or it could be a lattice or it could be this, this digital thing. So there's a, a, a second layer of homogenization that we do kind of at the material point level. That, and what we do is we connect then those microstructural variables that describe the, that, that describe that microstructure, say in a fibrous composite, a, a volume fraction and an aspect ratio of fi fibers, we then sort of build those into the objective of our optimization approach, as opposed to just say the density of them. So it's sort of this two scale kind of piece. And so as a result, we end up resolving the macroscopic topology of the, of the artifact. And at the same time, the microstructure of that underlying material that gives rise to the mechanical properties at each material point. Thank you so much, Martin. Very clear. Uh, I hope we'll discuss more about this and you're always welcome to visit when things are going to get better. Uh, Thank you. We need to move to the next session because uh, we are four minutes late, but it's okay, it's reasonable. Huh? If you remember, usually we are always much more late than this. So let's move to, thank you again, Martin. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation.